According to my watch, the big hand is on the four and the little hand's on the two. That means it's 10 o'clock. Dr. Klepner, please proceed. Okay, I will pick up where I stopped last time. I didn't mean to go on for so long and I'll try not to go on for so long, but I'll, uh, there are a number of odds and ends which I thought would be of interest. The topics that I'll be talking about the most accurate atomic clocks today. And a quick history of the global positioning system, a couple of exciting things, transformational technologies, that use, that type of language is used rather casually uh, for, you know, as a gimmick. But these are real transformational technologies. I'll tell you a little bit about the clocks tomorrow, and then I'm going to make a few comments about where this leaves time. Okay. So the starting point for the global positioning system was the invention of the atomic frequency standard, that is atomic clocks in 1955. I talked about this last time, but I didn't show the people who did, first did this. Essen and Perry at the National Physical Laboratory in England, they made a cesium atomic frequency standard and um, you can, it, it, it uses, it was made possible by the, this separated oscillatory field method. And you can actually see the oscillatory fields, the radiation which they're using to cause the transition comes down in the center in that pipe it goes, to, this is a three centimeter waveguide and one branch goes there and the other branch goes there and those are the separated oscillatory fields and here's the atomic beam in there. So that uh, sort of opened the floodgates. Now I showed this picture of the portable atomic clock by Gerald Zacharias in 1954. This is very significant because it made the way to a, a really practical atomic clock, namely one that you could wheel around. And this sort of sparked that, the type of atomic clock he was using here, the cesium beam, it became the standard atomic clock. But what I want to talk about is um, the, the rapid development of the global positioning system. Cesium beam atomic clocks were developed quite rapidly, first by the... Uh, the, the um, National radio? National radio, yeah, thank you. Um, now, at, uh, at about the same time, the space age, space age was launched. In particular, Sputnik was launched in 1957. And that triggered the development of the global positioning system. That, um, you know, Sputnik was just a small satellite which went around and just broadcast a continuous wave. So anyone with a good radio receiver could hear this thing when it came by. And of course, because of the Doppler effect, as, the, uh, as it approached, the frequency was pushed high. As it passed the lowest distance, the, the nearest distance, the frequency would, would change. And then as it went away, it would drop. And by looking at that dip in frequency, you could tell when it was at its closest point to you. This meant if you knew the orbit very well, which you do because it just obeys planetary motion and after a few trajectories, you know exactly where it'll be. You can tell how far the satellite was from you. That is sort of the seed idea for the global positioning system. Now with atomic clocks, you could think of having clocks in the satellites broadcasting all the time. And by seeing the time that these signals arrived on the ground, that you could locate where you were. I don't know who invented the term positioning system. It was a very novel term, but it's exactly right. It's not a navigation system. It simply tells you exactly where you are. And the DOD, particularly the Navy, immediately recognized the possibilities of this as use for a navigational tool. Now, this is just the time the clocks were, were being perfected. 
So it was reasonable to try to design a system which would make use of the clock accuracy to find out where you were on the ground. It's, the development began in the US Navy because they were always in charge of navigation and timekeeping. Um, the Air Force also became very interested in this for, you know, for navigating airplanes. The two services got into a, a rather heated rivalry for this. And that was res resolved in 74 with the idea of having a three service program. The a Air Force was the program manager but the people who really did the engineering on this and the engineering is fantastically ingenious in my view, was the Aerospace Corporation. Now, by 1991, there were atomic clocks on satellites and the first GPS systems, crew GCS systems were used the very first use though was in the, in the first Gulf War. And the system was so primitive then that the soldiers carried hand, um, hand carried civilian models really meant for sailors and you know, people traveling in the wilderness. But it, it, it was a fabulous success there. It allowed the armies to find their way through the minefields which otherwise had been considered a, an obstacle. So it was critical in making that war go very quickly. So then the, uh, the development went rather quickly. Now, the basic idea of the GPS system is if you have three clocks in space and you get timing signals from them, and you know where they were when they sent out their signals and you know where you are, you know the time when they arrive, then you can tell the distance there. Now you have to know these times very, very accurately because you know light travels at 300 million meters, at 300 million kilometers per second. So the problem is um, knowing your time. You can know the satellite time accurately. It has its own clock. And if you have a clock and you just compare your clock with these three satellites, you get three distances and that's enough to establish your position in three-dimensional space. The only difficulty is that it's rather difficult for everyone to have an atomic clock with them. And if you've wondered why that works, it works because you actually look at four satellites. Now, with, if you know the if you know the distance from four satellites, essentially you're overdetermined. You have three dimensions of space, but there's only one time which will make those commensurate. So that's how it works. It's a very simple idea, a very clever idea. And it moves very rapidly. And of course, now we have GPS navigation in, in our watch. We just take it for granted. But that really was a transformational technology in many respects, in respects of military respects, you know, in civilian usage, you know, finding out where trucks are on the roads, um, guiding uh, rescue equipment to seize in the middle of a storm at night. It's, it's just part of our lives that, that really changed the world. Now, it was developed as a military operation and the military was very jealous of, uh, of the system. Anyone with a receiver could pick up these signals. But because of that, the military used what was called, um, yes, selected availability was the euphemism for it. They intentionally dithered the system. They dithered the system so that you couldn't tell your distance within more than about um, the minimum of 10 meters and often 30 meters. 
the system was capable of resolutions of fraction of a meter or even centimeters. So it was intentionally degraded, but that prevented a lot of civilian use. So there was a big political battle over that. Uh, President Clinton resolved that by saying that it should be available to everyone for civilian use. And now you can get uh, your location to a matter of a fraction of a meter. And even better than that, for airplanes coming into an airport, for instance, you need to know your position. You'd like to know it within centimeters. You do that by having a receiver near the airport, which keeps monitoring its location on the GPS system. The plane monitors its location on the GPS system. By comparing the two signals, you can correct for any at atmospheric fluctuations, so you can get fantastically high resolution. And in fact, for, uh, for purposes of um, geodesy, for instance, you'd like to know how fast the San Andreas Fault slippage is along the San Andreas Fault, which is a matter of maybe a centimeter a year. You can do that with the GPS. So those are some of the things which came out. But it's interesting to note that when the atomic clocks were developed, no one was thinking of the GPS. The reason they were developed was to study Einstein's theory. It would be rather difficult to get Congress to appropriate money to study Einstein's theory, but they could appropriate money for basic research. And fortunately, they were doing that. So this is a wonderful argument for basic research. Now. I'd like to go back to Gerald Zacharias. He had a great idea. We're now back in uh, about 1960. To make your clocks as accurate as possible, you want to measure the frequency of the transition that you're looking at for as long as possible. The longer you can make that measurement, the more accurate it can be. In a cesium atomic beam machine, it takes the order of milliseconds for the atom to fly through the apparatus. That's a rather short observation time. He thought of getting a longer observation time by taking an atomic beam and sending it upwards in a, ca in a vacuum. It would go through an oscillating field on the way up and when it fell back down, it would go through another oscillating, same oscillating field again. But the time could be much longer, up to you know, a good fraction of a second. It was called the fountain clock. And he spent several years trying to develop the fountain clock. But the conclusion of these studies about 1965 is that slow atoms do not fall. They weren't there. Eventually, it was realized why there are no slow atoms in this uh, molecular beam. It's that the fast atoms behind them knocked them out of the way. So it was an idea, a good idea, but it was ahead of its time. Ahead of its time means roughly 30 years ahead of its time, because now what was developed were ultra cold atoms were created. And one of the um, one of the applications of ultra cold atoms was to a fountain clock. When I say transformational, I mean very quickly, the Nobel Prize was awarded to these three people, Steve Chu, Claude Contenucci, and Bill Phillips. Bill was my graduate student, so I have a very, you know, well, I'm naturally proud to have had such a brilliant student. Actually, naturally lucky to have had such a brilliant student. But anyway, if you look today, at the nation's primary time standard, it's a fountain clock. The fountain clocks work like a charm if your atoms are at a very low temperature. Very low temperature is they essentially are standing still in some sort of optical trap. Then you can give them a little nudge with any impulse that you want. They're at the base of the clock over here. The laser light gives them a little push they go up, up there and they fall back down. And this, the uncertainty here is three times 10 to the minus 16th. This is our primary time standard. Actually, two of these clocks are used. 
and they're st still being developed. So they're not run continuously. There's a battery of actually hydrogen masers, about 10 hydrogen masers which run and their frequencies are combined to give sort of a working standard. And that working standard is calibrated against these primary standards uh, sort of every, every month or so. But with that, we have an uncertainty of three times 10 to the minus 16th in the standards that we can broadcast. Now, I'd like to talk about a second transformational technology I was rather cavalier in saying that these atoms are given a nudge. The reason you can do that is that these are ultra cold atoms. Now the ultra cold atoms can have temperatures down to a millikelvin, a, million, a thousandth of an absolute degree. Then they were reduced to a micro kelvin. And now they've even been observed at temperatures of uh, actually in the picokelvin regime, these things are just sitting still and they give the opportunity for doing a new type of spectroscopy of operating an atomic clock at optical frequencies, which are roughly a million times higher than the microwave frequencies. So you could get a corresponding improvement in, in the accuracy. The problem is there is no way to measure the frequency of light. At least there wasn't until this device, the optical frequency comb was invented. It was invented by two groups independently from 95 to 2000. And in 2005, the Nobel Prize was awarded to John uh, John Hall and, uh, and Ted Hench. Now, its operation is a little bit difficult to ex explain. So I'll just say that one can now measure the frequency of light to the same precision that you can control an atomic clock. And furthermore, you can do that at any frequency. You can do it, uh, the frequency comb is literally that, it's, it's a spectrum which has lines in it, typically uh, a, a, a typically of the order of maybe a megahertz apart, but it goes from DC to optical. And with that comb available, if you have a signal, you can beat it against any tooth in that comb that you want and tell exactly what its frequency is. And this opened the way to making optical atomic clocks and they were developed, well, they're still not developed, but the technology is being developed. Um, this was in 2008. Here is the frequency ratio of two atoms using single ion clocks. I mentioned the single ion clock, well, single ion spectroscopy before. You can take an ion and hold it in space by a combination of electromagnetic magnetic and uh, yeah and electric fields and what struck me that first of all they're looking at a precision which is much higher than anything previously and this really this development occurred rather quickly here is a schematic diagram of an optical comb going over the full optical spectrum here is red, up there is blue, and it keeps going. You have one clock, this is a, it, it operates on the uh, mercury ion. You look at its frequency and compare the frequency, the, the nearest by frequency comb right there. And this is a beryllium clock, which operates at another frequency. And you can compare that with another tooth on the comb but you know the distance between these to atomic clock accuracy. So you've compared these two very different types of uh, frequency standards uh, in the optical regime. And that's sort of the heart of the optical atomic clock. <laughs> 
what struck me about this is if you look at the experiment, any experiment like this always lists the sources of error in the experiment, small corrections that you need to make. And one of the small corrections over there is the gravitational red shift. This, let me see if I can, oh. This is obscured right here, yeah. But the gravitational shift over here, this is one part in 10 to the 18th per centimeter of altitude difference. And there's an uncertainty there of about one centimeter. The reason for that is these clocks were in kind of different buildings. And you had to know the gravitational field in each building. Now, we take the small g is pretty constant over the earth, but not that constant. It's affected by nearby mass. It has small gradients in it. And if you're trying to measure the distance really accurately, you can't just rely on, um, uh, on the constancy of g. You have to measure the acceleration of gravity uh, at each end. So th that comes down to a surveying problem. And it introduced an uncertainty here of one centimeter. The reason that struck me was that the, uh, the goal for making atomic clocks was just to observe this gravitational redshift. I mean, that's what interested me in it. That's what interested everyone else, all the pioneers in making atomic clocks were interested in measuring that. Well, it was measured, it was measured uh, by putting a hydrogen maser in a, in a rocket which went up very high, roughly the Earth's diameter and came back and the frequency was tracked all along the way. And the, the gravitational redshift was confirmed to one part in 10,000. So that, that was satisfying. It just demonstrated what people knew, namely Einstein was correct, but it did demonstrate it. But it was kind of a wonder to demonstrate it. Then when the GPS was developed for navigational purposes, it was essential to know that. If you neglected general relativity in, in your GPS system, you would miss by a long shot. I think I calculated once a, a plane leaving from San Francisco to go to New York would end in Washington DC instead. So you need to know this very well. So it's important knowledge. So it went from being a novelty to important knowledge. And now it's become a problem. How do you compare clocks in different places? You need to know the gravitational potential at each place. Now, gravitational potential, if you like the gravitational field difference, um, is measured from a hypothetical surface, the geoid, which is a surface which is constructed by geophysicists in which the value of g, little g, is assumed to be constant. You'd like to know your altitude over the geoid. There's a problem in that. The geoid fluctuates. That's because the mass distribution on the Earth fluctuates on these scales that we're looking at. It typically fluctuates by um, four or five centimeters. So how are you going to compare clocks in different places? Well, there are two approaches to that. One is you try to get transmission systems, optical cable systems, for instance, um, which will you can use to compare your time transmissions to this accuracy. But that's a great challenge. Nonetheless, people are working on it. You're much better off in the, the Europeans than in the United States, because for instance, in the United States, NIST is, has two basic laboratories. The time standards work is done in Boulder, Colorado. The uh, uh, other standards work is done is NIST in Bethesda, Maryland. 
and running a continuous cable across the continent, well, it's not something you can do, but it's just impractical. They're working on ways to try to compare the clocks there. But another approach is you just compare the two clocks and use the result to tell you how much gravity is changing. This is geodesy. Now, it turns out that's a very important problem. There is a mission which goes on continuously of two satellites following each other in the same orbit and constantly measuring the difference in distance between them. And from that, you can infer the variations of gravity over the Earth. From that, you can infer the distribution of water on the Earth, for one thing. That's a major contribution to the changes in the geoid. That is very important to know, for instance, for issues of climate change. So you could think of making a network of clocks around the world, comparing them just to measure the climate. But beyond that, yeah, well, this is just an article I picked up to show that that work was underway um, measuring, this is the GRACE mission of two satellites. But beyond that, we can try to see what the implications of this are. Now, what made the optical clocks possible was not only the frequency comb, it was the fact that we have ultra cold atoms now. This is a picture of a gas of atoms, which is illuminated by resonant radiation. You probably can't see it there, but if you look very careful here, come on. you can see there are little chains of atoms. They're next to each other. Lots of little change. They're not all fully resolved. But in fact, that's exactly what's taking place there. What we have is atoms which are held fixed in space in a potential well, sort of an egg-shaped carton over here, which is created by standing waves. At these very low temperatures, the force of light on these atoms is considerable. It's enough to trap them in space. They just sit at the bottom of these wells, which are created by laser radiation. Let's go back here. How that takes place is, well, if we look at one atom over here, we have laser light shining on a resonant transition. It's coming in this way and it's coming in that way. It's, this light is below the transition frequency slightly. So any atom which moves towards this light comes into resonance and it will absorb a photon. But if it's moving in the other direction, it won't. It, it'll be shifted out of resonance. So th this arrow over here repels atoms moving in this direction. Well, what about that direction? Well, here is a, a, a traveling wave coming in there which is below resonance, and it repels it in that direction. In fact, this is a standing wave, but you know a standing wave is two running waves. So you can bring it to rest along this axis, and then you do it along the other two axes too. This was discovered by Steve Chu, who was one of the participants in the Nobel Prize for this. He developed something called optical molasses, you just take a gas of atoms. They have to be reasonably cold to start with, <clears throat> but you bombard them in three dimensions and they basically come to rest. Well, they come to rest and then they'll just fall. They're not trapped, but, and in fact, they did just fall. But then if you put on the trapping potential like that, you can have them fall into a trap you can do this with very high precision. You can arrange it so there's just one atom in each of these potential wells, or there may be two, or there may be three. These atoms, if you have just one in each well, essentially are in a free space. They do not speak to the atoms nearby. Their interactions are so small, but you can control those interactions so you can turn it off and on. And by that way, if you start with lots of atoms in there, you can tune it to having any number that, that you want in each of these spaces. 
and that gives rise to the um, ultra cold atomic clock. This is one of two technologies. The other one was an iron in a trap. Now the iron in the trap is a beautiful device, but there's only one of them. So the signal rate is rather low. If you can look at lots of atoms at the same time, the signal rate can be much higher and be useful. Here is a picture. This is provided by Jun Yi. In the background, you can probably see faintly lines. Those are the atoms in a, in a trap in which there is only one atom in each cell. This forms a three-dimensional lattice. That cube there, has, as it's shown here, is what five atoms on each side. It's superposed over here because if you look carefully, all of the atoms underneath are lined up along those cells. So you've got a three-dimensional array of atoms all sitting still. And this is an ideal thing for making a, a, an atomic clock you have lots of atoms at rest. And this, these, these clocks are at least time standards. They're not practical clocks yet. But here's a comparison done by Jun Yi of, let me go. To, uh, here is a three-dimensional clock. You can also just have a, a two-dimensional clock, the atoms and disks next to each other. And these two clocks are being compared with each other. And the way you compare them with each other is you tune the frequencies on uh, onto this clock and onto that clock. And you compare that with a, um, an optical frequency cone. And that, <clears throat> that allows you to tell the difference in these clocks to very, very high precision. If you'd like to use th th this precision for some other purpose at some other frequency, you just latch on to another tooth on the comb and you know where they are. Now, this was a measurement of six parts in 10 to the 19th in one hour, okay? It means if you wanted to use this to measure the altitude of the clocks, you can do that to a few millimeters in one hour. This is a large step forward, it's here. Remember, the, the fountain clocks are operating at a, a few parts in 10 to the 16th. Here are clocks which are a thousand times more accurate. And this isn't the end of it. It's believed that the, one can move down into the region of 10 to the minus 20 or 21st. What limits you then is, is, is basically temperature, not the temperature of the gas, the atoms are essentially at zero energy, but there's always some ra radiation in the system. Even at very low temperatures, you have a little black body radiation and your ability to control that radiation limits you because that radiation alters the energy of the atoms, not by much, but now we're talking about these fabulously low energies. So, that, um, it, 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 this is exciting to me, basically because no one knows really what to do with it. One of the things is you can just watch and see if these uh, frequencies change, the relative frequencies of atoms, because possibly the fundamental constants are changing as the universe expands. That's sort of the one basic uh, test that these are good for but no one expects them to change and tests so far haven't shown that. The question is, we have such a fabulous advance in technology. I'm surprised that applications really haven't developed. Geodesy is one application and that may come along, but that's an old application and it's not clear what knowing the geodetic potentials, you know, to a part in a thousand will do for you when you only need to know them to a part in 10. So here we have a technology waiting for an application. Now, there's another aspect of this. If you want to compare two clocks, 
you really have to bring them together right now. Over shorter distances, you can compare them over optical cables, but for longer distances, you can't. But it brings up the question, if you can't compare the clocks, what does time mean? What do you really mean to really understand the difference in clock rates? You have got to be able to um, take into account the effect of gravity. Now, when Einstein wrote his paper on special relativity, it starts out not talking about time, but talks about synchronizing clocks. It's a very clear and straightforward discussion of how you synchronize clocks when you have to allow for the fact that the signals travel at the speed of light. There is no such discussion in general relativity. There is no way to synchronize clocks in general relativity. And the reason is because it depends on the distribution of nearby mass. You will know immediately that you have a tough problem because if you're going to include gravity into the definition, you're going to include large G, the gravitational constant. The gravitational constant is one of the embarrassments of science. It's only known to about four parts in 10,000. The other fundamental constants are known to parts in 100 million or parts in a billion. So any definition which includes large G is inherently in trouble. But beyond that, you might say, is the idea of time inherently in trouble? If there's no way that you can compare clocks generally without knowing about the distribution of mass nearby, then the, the, the concept of timekeeping has changed. It means timekeeping is a strictly local affair. You can compare, you can measure time in the same spot, but you can't measure time over any distance. It means your time is not mine time. Now, that's of no practical consequence at all right now, but I think it is, it's a conceptual question. What do we mean by time? Well, I started the, this lecture by saying no one really knows what time is. And now I'd say, unfortunately, we seem to be getting more ignorant as time goes by. So that is, I would, I was going to make some comments if, if time permits, I've made them. So thank you. I have one. Mm -hmm. What is the 5G uh, uh, wireless standards frequency going to do to upset uh, GPS uh, operation and all of this other stuff you're talking about? Well, the GPS operation takes into account gravity as well as we need it right now. Now, if you really like the full uh, benefit of these clocks and compare uh, distances, uh, you know, measure distances to microns, you know, comparing where my clock is and your clock is to one micron, then you would be in trouble. But there's no, no need for doing that so far. So uh, you'd have to have a very good reason to do that. And then people might start thinking seriously about how you can comment on um, this comparison of clocks at uh, NIST in Boulder. NIST in Boulder is, is a few kilometers away from the, the JILA, which is their scientific institute. And they had a clock in each of those and they wanted to compare them. And the YES geodetic survey came in to find the gravitational difference over that distance, which was just a few kilometers. And they ended up by being able to measure it to a few millimeters, which is quite extraordinary, but it was a huge undertaking. Yeah. So th that's one case where the redshift really uh, it limited their precision in comparing clocks. And just one, one further, uh, Jerry, just one second, please. Uh, just one further co uh, question. How does uh, the use of time uh, perform or, or interact with uh, space travel, where here we are on the Earth, and then we're going to uh, the moon, we have been to the moon, Mars, other things, when it's important to correlate time at some at 
at some point in the future, it'll be important to correlate time between the two uh, yeah. objects. What, how does that work? Well, um, many years ago, there was a um, satellite launch to go out of the solar system. I forget the name of it, maybe the Explorer. It just goes- Voyager, Voyager, Pardon? it was Voyager. Voyager, yeah. And uh, its time was tracked, its position was tracked from Earth by, um, well, using hydrogen masers on Earth as a time standard, by sending a signal to the Voyager, it would send the signal back. And the question was, you know, they were trying to understand gravity at these very large distances. So you, you can always do that. Now, um, in, in the solar system, uh, the time difference is never that really that large, but if you're going to real space, space exploration, you have to account for it. But, but you can quite well. You, Interesting. Yeah. It, it, all I can say, it, it's not a limiting problem now, but it's something you have to think about. Yeah. Jerry, go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. Well, actually, I was going to ask the same question about deep space, but I will tell you a, a little anecdote that I was talking to a surveyor who was in my neighborhood, and he had a piece of GPS equipment and was also using his regular old equipment. I said, I asked him what the difference was. He says, he said that um, what he had in his hand, the GPS thing, he said that this cheap Home Depot stuff only gets you to an inch and a half. So you've gone from MIT <laughs> to the surveyor to Home Depot. Yeah, well, when this first became available, I, I got hold of one of these um, uh, holding your hand devices. And I remember going on long walks and just watching it and being amazed that I could see my, my progress over the surface of the earth. And I could calculate as I moved along in a straight line, how many steps I would need to take before I got back to the same position. I but mean, they only had you for to in the universe to only an inch and a half. Yeah. Well, it changes your perspective of things. One thing it changed my perspective on, you always lose something when you make technical advances. What we lost there w was the concept of wilderness. Your only excuse for not knowing where you are is that your batteries ran down. You know, the idea of really being by yourself independently off has vanished. You always know where you are. Now, for many reasons, that's quite convenient. But for other reasons, it's inconvenient. If you like to go off to the wilderness to be really alone, well, you're not really alone. You know where you are, or if you don't, you're careless. So it's one of the downsides. Uh, can I ask a question about the basic experiments that are being done? Um, have there been experiments with different isotopes of a given atom to see what the frequency changes might occur? Well, yes, there have been sort of many experiments which reflect on that. I mean, one experiment is just in the equivalence principle. You know, the equivalence principle says that uh, a gravitational, locally, you can't tell the difference between a gravitational acceleration down or an acceleration of your system going up. That's the famous Einstein elevator. And that has been invest investigated to very, very high precision. Within atoms, different atoms have been just monitored because they have different constitutions of you know, fundamental particles. And the question is, if time is, um, if time is shifting globally, are the fundamental constants shifting too? This is the constancy of the fundamental constants. And there've been lots of experiments which would show that. I mean, the, 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 the um, time scale for doing that is, you know, is one second over the lifetime of the universe, which is roughly what four times 10 to the 14th years. The reason I asked the question is more to do with the effects of mass on 
time. In other words, the gravitational effect. Yeah. Well, um, there's no evidence of that so far. Yeah, I would think I would think that the gravitational constant being so darn small that you just can't measure those kinds of frequency changes. I mean, to me, theoretically, it does exist, but those actual the measurements you can't get them precise enough that you can see the effect that I'm thinking of. I think, I, unless I'm totally wrong. Are you thinking of a, bit of a change in gravity itself? Yes. Yeah. Um, you can't measure, the, as I say, it, because gravity is so weak and G is so poorly known, there's nothing you can say about it right now on a cosmic scale. Well, the thing, what, the thing I was thinking of is if you, you're looking at transitions, electronic transitions in these atoms, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So those, if, if, if the mass has an effect on the uh, frequency of those transitions, then you're going to be able to make this, this measurement. You, you should see a frequency difference if the mass has a, has a big effect on time no. or has an effect on time that you can measure. But I'm thinking probably that we can't do it. We, uh, even if no. you change the mass by two or three neutrons you still probably are you did your your ability to make those measurements I'm the thinking, dominant I'm force in, in atoms is the electrostatic force that's so many orders of magnitude larger than any gravitational attraction okay that, that g is off the scale okay great well, yeah well not only that but when you change the nature of the nucleus you change the hyperfine interaction so there are addition, there are other forces that are interfering. But well, you should be able to correct those. Correct yeah. for those. I mean the well, nuclear interaction, well there's a magnetic interaction and an electric interaction. And um, again, gravity is negligible compared to those interactions. Right. And you can correct for them only only just so well. Yeah. Yeah. Now where you might expect to see this is at black holes. At black holes, we have what's called strong gravity. And the theory of strong gravity is, is not, uh, has never really been tested. And possibly if this gravitational, uh, you know, ast astronomy, um, really improves in resolution, one will be able to see that. What you see is light that's being emitted as particles are just going over the, um, you know, the, the surface of the black hole surface. And one does not really know how they behave. On the other hand, the calculations for the shape of the pulse of the gra first gravitational wave detected were remarkably accurate. And so, I, 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 I'm just not an expert on strong gravity. I was going to tell an interesting anecdote about the early GPS system. My son is an archaeologist and he works out in the Middle East in the country of Oman out in the desert. So back in early 2000s, late um, 1990s, uh, 90s, he um, he was out in the desert. He had a rudimentary GPS system. And at that time, it had about, I don't know, 25 meter accuracy, 10 meter accuracy, something like that. But of course, he was out of, away from the news. He couldn't get any news. And he goes to sleep one night. He has this 10 meter accuracy. The next morning, he wakes up. And all of a sudden, it's, it's you know, down to feet, inches. And he, he can't figure out what, went, what happened overnight. But when what happened was that was when Clinton turned to, to oh, ordered them yeah. to turn off the jitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it it well there was I could see where the military was uh, hesitant about didn't didn't want to do that, but it certainly was a lifesaver for many people.